are honoring Judy Chicago at our gala this year. Yes. <laughs> classes and they could last for two or three days and we're not allowed to bring your emotions in the classroom. <laughs> and this like right so like you know so I, I just I felt like it, there was still a lot of inequality within that system and I was always saddened and that was and then I taught there later for two and a half years and that's when my students did that um, I remember there was a series of talks 
that brought a lot of feminist talks. Didn't that grow out of finding the feminist archives in the dumpster? Well, that's the rumor. Yeah. That's the rumor is that actually I believe it's like, I don't know if this is true, but I heard that the, the feminist archives were thrown out by the super shop dumpster and they were picked up and took to Otis. Oh, wow. And I think that's what makes the collection at Otis. So it was this real, I think, patriarchal like destruction <laughs> of a history, erasure of a history. And so um, CalArts had come to me recently and asked me to do something, to make something, and I said, I am I am happy to make something, you know, as a fundraiser, like a multiple, and they're like, how can we help you? And I was like, give me all of the names of the original women in the Feminist Art Program. Who were the students? And they gave me a list that was women like 10 to 15 years later. It wasn't even the right time. So then I said, so then I, I wrote you, and then we started writing Suzanne, and we've been trying to build this list, and I also asked a student who was there at the time, Nancy from Go like, <laughs> Gosha, who worked for Suzanne Vielmetter, who used to work for Suzanne Vielmetter, and she photographed every page of the archive for me at CalArts. It's in two, fi two files is all that's left, two file boxes. And so I just started reaching out you know, I just, I care about this stuff. Like, I just want to know who they were. I worry about this history. So Judy and I have, and, and have become closer just like asking these questions and her telling me to reach out to people. And it's just sort of a, an email list that started. I, I sort of thought Sarah Thornton should write about it once I figure out like what to do with all the art, with these conversations. But it's crazy. It's like, oh yeah, well what about so-and-so? She left halfway through. She was like dating Jim Morrison. Like the stories are amazing. But I'm just, I care about that history and I'm just trying. And so that's how you and I started talking about this and thinking about what are the similarities in conceptualism and, and feminism? What are the differences? Well, I mean, you've written about the program and I've worked with Suzanne so closely, so I feel like I've gotten a sense of it, but I feel like so much of it has been erased or hidden or, you know, in a and way. What about when you started, what about when you started showing in LA? What, what was that like when you first kind of made your professional debut? I don't know, I mean, it seemed like there was still, oh, I mean, you know, we felt, we felt so lucky to have been the generation after you all, like all the women feminist artists. And I called myself a feminist. That was like at a time when there was this post-feminist thing, when like yeah. feminism was a bad word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it, it felt really unequal to me, but we were always being told that like, like I had in Germany, I had, it was in a group show, and a, the curator told me, you know, feminism happened, it's over. You don't need to talk about this. <laughs> so like, you know, we felt so much better off than you all, but at the same time, we couldn't acknowledge our, we were almost afraid to acknowledge our own inequities, if that makes sense, I don't know. I also would say as a, as a curator and an art historian coming up at that time, and I remember the two Manila file boxes or files or whatever at CalArts because you I was researching them. them. Right? I went through them and I was like, you're kidding me, this is all that's left. But also, we had never seen any of this work in person. And, and mm -hmm. that was what was so incredible too. There was this kind of appetite for a history that actually didn't exist. That we, I mean, it existed in the basements of museums, but it wasn't on view. We had never seen your work, so many, you know, Suzanne's work, many of the artists of your peers. We hadn't seen any of it in person and very little of it in reproduction. So I, I always felt like part of the reason that I even wanted to organize that show at that time, and I started working on it in the late 1990s, was to materialize something, to make a history and make a show that you had to make it if you wanted to see it. It was the only way to see it. I just want to make sure that everybody knows what we're talking about. <laughs> uh, does everybody know what the feminist art programs were? Yes or no? no. Yes. 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 Yes, you all know. No. No. Um, I, I came up 
in LA in the 1960s. And uh, it was incredibly inhospitable to women. That's why the show is so amazing to me because it's bringing back work that was either I had to destroy because I didn't get it, wasn't getting anywhere with it, or was had been erased from the history of Southern California art, even though I was actually very active in the LA art scene. I was like the only woman who was taken seriously. I uh, was in a lot of major shows, like a uh, 10 part cylinder in the back was in LA County Sculpture of the 60s show, which probably had, I don't know, three women, maybe. Uh, but it was a big piece, and after I showed it, even though I was in that show, nothing happened, and I couldn't afford to store it, so I had to destroy it. Uh, Rainbow Pickett was in the first minimal show at the Jewish Museum in uh, New York in a show called Primary Structures, 42 artists, okay. three women. 1966. 1966. Yeah, I did that in 1965, and um, they were always celebrating the history of the Primary Structure show all the time. Like in 2014, they did a show at the Jewish Museum kind of redoing a kind of Contemporary primary structure show, and the best part of the show was a reconstruction of the old Jewish museum with the primary structure in it. It was like a little model, it was great. It was very cool. Picture. But then now this year they're doing a 50 year anniversary thing in T Magazine about the primary structure show. I actually had the funniest conversation with Jeffrey about because this guy, Arthur Google, interviewed me for the T Magazine article. He was all upset about he wanted to find some artists who had gone to it. And like, I was like so young and not aware and kind of on the margins of the LA art scene that nobody told me that when you have are in a big New York show, you're supposed to get on the airplane. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so I told Jeffrey that story. He said, Really? You know, if I knew you then and I was showing you, I would have paid your ticket and I would have gone with you. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. He said, but then on the other hand, if I said, Jeffrey, you know, if that had happened, if I had a dealer who did that, the whole trajectory of my career would be different. And the Jeffrey said, yeah, but then that wouldn't be feminist starch. I did a talk, I was invited to do a talk, and I talked about how Rainbow Pickett <coughs> broke my heart, okay, over and over again. Because I was in a studio in Pasadena in the 60s with two other artists when the art world was completely different. We had a 5,000 square foot space for which we paid in total $75 a month, <laughs> $25 a month a piece, okay? Anyway. There was a very powerful curator on the West Coast then, Walter Hobbs. Mm -hmm. And he worked at the Pasadena Museum, and he used to go around to all the studios of artists working at Pasadena. I was the only woman. And when I finished Rainbow Pickett, Walter came to the studio, you know the story, and he literally refused to look at it. Wow. Just the story I'm going to tell you is going to tell you exactly what it was like in the 1960s. Okay. So it broke my heart. It was not. It was because of my of my dealer then, Ralph Nelson, that it went to the primary structure show. But nothing happened, and I ended up having to destroy Rainbow Picket. Although Ann Goldstein reconstructed it for a minimal future at LA Mocha in 204. But anyway, years later, I saw Walter. By then I had published Through the Flower and I talked about it in my first book. 
but I didn't mention him, but he had obviously read through the flower because we had breakfast in Washington. He said, I know you hated me. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and he said, but you have to understand what it was like in the 60s. Women in the LA art scene were either groupies or artists' wives. So what was I to make of the fact that you were making art that was stronger than the men's? It was like I walked into a room and there was a woman pulling up her skirt. This is really the 60s, actually it's the 50s. Rolling down her stockings and revealing her whatevers. I just had to avert my eyes. And then he looked at me as if I was supposed to say, oh, Walter, I really understand. <laughs> the reason I'm telling this story is because it illustrates the fact of why I could get nowhere with so much of the work in this show. And in terms of Cal Arts, after a decade and a half of struggling in the LA art scene to get somewhere, I just like, I'm like, and seeing women who I've gone to graduate school with drop out, I thought, the hell with this. And I made such a, I made a really radical change. I went to Fresno and I set up a program for young women. I knew what I wanted to do, but I was very superstitious. I still am. I was very superstitious when I was young. I never wanted to talk about anything before I did it, and I'm still like that in a way. Like, I could never understand, like, my male peers, they would have people in their studio while they were in the middle of something, and they'd say, oh, yes, I'm working on this, and they'd explain it, and I'm like, no. It's like when I did Pasadena Lifesavers, there are 15 of them in the series, and I put them out, it took a year and a half, and I put them in racks until I was completely finished with them. I didn't show anybody for the whole year and a half. But anyway, so I told the head of the art department in Fresno that I wanted to try and help young women become professionalized without having to do what I had done, which is like hide my gender and my work. And he thought that was nice, but that wasn't really what I wanted to do. I went there with the intent, with the intention of figuring out, like, could it be possible to make a female-centered art? Was there such a thing? Could there be a feminist art practice? And as part of that, I thought if I help young women make art from who they are as women without having to suppress their gender, maybe I could find my way back myself. So that was the beginning of, that was the first feminist art program. And Suzanne Lacey was in it, where are you? She's right. Suzanne Lacey was in it, I, had, I interviewed young women to be in it, and Suzanne said to me, as I asked them, like, why do you want to be in the program? And Suzanne says, well, I'm really a psychology major, but I want to be creative. And I'm like, oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> out. Like, oh. <laughs> Right. Okay. But anyway, so she just had a retrospective as a So the first year, we're going to compress the first two questions between in this. In Can this I ask year. you one question? Yes. Yeah. How how did you make the deal, the switch from Fresno to CalArts? Who 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 was that with? No, it wasn't Paul. It was, well, it was Paul. He was the dean. Uh, so, I, I, my students and I went off campus because I knew it was important to have a space. This is when you were at campus. This, no, this is in Fresno. Right. Right. We didn't intend to be off campus at, at, in, in Cal Arts. We intended to be on the campus. But it wasn't ready, which is how we happened to do Woman House because we were meeting in, in living rooms. But anyway, so I did this program, this intensive program for young women in Fresno. And I mean, I was only 30, okay? So 
it was like when I started the program, it was kind of like it exploded, you know, because there was all this young energy from these women who had a lot to say, but didn't want who, for whom, like one of my students, Nancy Yodelman, who wanted to be a sculptor, did not want to take sculpture courses at Fresno State because she would have to make plaster blocks. And that is when I actually started understanding how curriculum, our curriculum, is inherently biased against women. Because what she wanted to do was work with clothing and needle and thread. And that was complete taboo in those days. So, you know, once I gave them permission to be themselves, things just exploded. And, you know, I was young. And so, like, we invited a famous, New York feminist theoretician, T. Grace Atkinson, I invited to come to the studio. And so my like exuberant students, they're like, oh, we're gonna make these costumes. So they made these costumes and they developed these cop chairs and the costumes said, see you in duty, right? So we go to the airport to pick her up and they're wearing their costumes and these Shriders get off the plane and they're like, see you, see you, see you. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> But I had met Miriam Shapiro in San Diego. She and Paul were teaching there, and she was older than me. And she had come through abstract expressionism, which in New York, which was even less supportive of women than the LA art scene. And I just called her up cold and said, I, you know, I really need someone to talk to. So then she came up to Fresno. She delivered the first talk she'd ever given on her work. Nobody had ever invited her to talk about her work. That, that was a big part of it too, not only the imagery that was part, you know, and the subject matter that was part of the curriculum, but also just helping these women think themselves into being artists in terms of how do you organize your work? How do you talk about not your work? Yeah, what do you mean? How do you slide? So you know, forget it. We weren't there. It was like, how do you not say, <laughs> How do you stand up and introduce yourself? How do you build a wall in the studio? How do you work every day on regular hours? How do you have a studio of your own? Because like when Mimi and I went around LA in the 70s looking for women artists, I mean, they were behind their boyfriend's studios working in kitchens, or they were like Lucita Hurtado was working in a closet, right? So, um, Minnie came and saw what I was doing, and then she and Paul offered me a job at CalArts. Now, I had never planned to stay in Fresno. I mean, Fresno is like the navel of California. I never planned to be in California. I always wanted to go back to LA, but I could not have done what I was doing in LA. So, I had to have time away to think. So I was ecstatic, my God, and they were going to bring some of my students, and Mimi was helping them put together their portfolios, and I was ecstatic. The first major art school in the country is going to provide us with a budget, because, you know, we just funded everything ourselves. I mean, I and all the students paid $25 a month for the studio and for materials, and so here's Cal Arts. We're going to give you this huge space. We're going to give you, we're bringing in an art historian to take your ragtag slide file that I had started by myself, looking for slides by women artists and then my students' help. They were going to bring in an art historian. They were going to develop the slide archive. They were going to give us a budget. Oh my God, you know, in our own space. It was incredible, right? Well, of course, like everything that is too good to be true it was too good to be true. But what happened was when we all came down here was that Cal Arts was not ready. They had been, the school was in this old nunnery in Burbank while the Valencia was being built, the campus. And so they, um, there was no place for us to meet. So we were first meeting in everybody's living rooms. And then Paula Harper, the art historian, came up with this idea, why don't we do a project about the house, the home? 
And that turned into the first major, the first female center installation in history called Woman House. Mm -hmm. Which had You know, people do, like, men and women in Germany do a woman house, you know, there was a show, <laughs> women house, which, by the way, I was originally not in, did you know that? Oh. It was only because of Susan Fisher Sterling at Nemois that they decided they might not put me in to the show, commemorating the project, me and my students. There you go. Anyway, so but when we got on the campus, <laughs> after we got on campus, I gave it to <laughs> Well, it's not the best thing. <laughs> the windows don't open. No, but the thing is, is that there were huge amounts of archival material. Yeah, I know. Huge. Where did they go? And the other thing about this that was so painful to me about it was, of course, my whole career has been about overcoming the erasure of women's history, of our achievements, of our cultural production. And to have that happen to Woman House, it's like, even when Pacific Standard Time happened, I was really shocked that of all the things they recreated, nobody ever recreated Woman House. Probably the single most important, like Andrew Kirchick says, Woman House was probably one of the most important yes. installations in 20th century art, right? So many of the artists are still around. Right, yeah. and nobody has ever proposed recreating Woman House. Which tells you something about the ongoing lack of interest in what women do and did into the 90s and now you come into this terrain where but you made. all are just like mythic and we can't find a lot of information out about what had happened which is crazy right like it's the same school we attended and i can't find much out i have you know, a question about what about the men i mean you, you mentioned now there are many you know male artists thinking about feminism and making Women House and so on. But at the time, there were so many artists, I mean, I've been working with Larry Pippen, who talks about being at CalArts and being so influenced by the legacy of Women's House and the feminist art program. And that program, what did you do with the male artists who wanted to even enter the program? Was there such oh, a- Oh, no, we must be it kidding. Wasn't that, yeah. <laughs> Not that. I didn't, I didn't start thinking about whether the pedagogical methods I developed in the 70s could also you know, be um, beneficial to men and artists of color until the 90s when Donald and I started te team teaching around the country and, you know, had men in the program, but not then, not in the 70s. The students, first of all, even me at that time could not be myself around men. It was just impossible. And uh, if I couldn't, imagine young 19 and 20 year old students early in their formation, they would never have been able to open up. Because, you know, it's like one of the reasons the young women, I still call them Fresno girls, and they're like, Judy, we're all in our 60s and 70s. I mean, I have to always be girls to me. Um, you know, I mean, like when we would have discussions, and I'd go around the circle and ask them their opinions, and it took them a really long time to be able to form them. And I'd say, you know, why? And they said, nobody ever asked us what our opinions were. <laughs> you know, they were used to being in mixed groups where they were Susie and Nancy and so and so's girlfriend. And the men carried on conversations and they didn't participate. So, I mean, not we were, not we were. We, I had to deal with that level of. And I knew that. I knew that I had to do what we used to call female wellness, the construct of femininity that became the term that was preventing these young women from being able to realize their ambitions as artists. And that I would have to help them. I mean, I did that by myself in my studio. I want to just before we leave, maybe these very early years, if you could just talk a little bit about the the performance that is behind us, because this fireworks pieces, yeah, the fireworks pieces, which you still continue to do, but which started at this early time, late six, and talk about a little bit about the color in these, but also in the other works too. Well, 
you know, when, when young women, I to interview them, they're always asking, you know, like, what it was like in the 60s. You know, when I tell them that the best compliment you could get was you paint like a man, <laughs> they're like speechless, of course, right? Um, but anything, everything that was any hint of my gender was unacceptable. My color, my imagery. Uh, in fact, even at Pacific Standard Time, Andrew told me that some of my male peers objected to the inclusion of one of the flesh gardens because it was too emotive, too uh, fleshy. Right. So, I mean, even claiming my color, which uh, took me a long time. So, however, I, I want to say that even though the 60s was really tough, I built my formal vocabulary, including my color systems. I did a lot of work on color in the 60s. Um, and exploring how color could be used to convey a mode of states. And so I developed these color systems and I was using them in the, my domes. That this, the, what you have to realize is that in terms of this work, like there were 30 domes, there were 15 Tassadina lifesavers, there were six flesh bands, there were five flesh bands. I mean, it was just, there were 30 fireworks. But, my point is that in my color systems that I used, so the domes were successive uh, form domes that I then sprayed at different levels. So there was color at different levels. So it was kind of encased color, but it was laid out in a certain system like Tessie and Lifesavers. And when I was right at the same time I was doing the domes that I started fireworks and I laid out the fireworks exactly the same way I laid out the color inside so you could say it was kind of like you know hindsight you can always understand your gestures I didn't understand at the time but it was obviously here I'm about to go to Fresno it was obviously a kind of gesture of liberation okay liberating my color into the air and you know, this is how it was so now the great thing about the early the late 60s and early 70s is my friends and I would just go to Santa Barbara, I would buy color smoke, and we would light it. Everybody would do something. Either people would light flares, or they brought food, or they took pictures. You know, it was like my early collaborations. But I mean, it's like that piece on the bridge in Fullerton. It'd be impossible. But I did fireworks pieces in the National Forest. And then I did this trip up the Northwest Coast where I saw later on, I thought, oh my God, I put color smoke in every aura that's going up the Northwest Coast. <laughs> but then once I had, once we were here in, back in LA with my students, then I started doing these, because I got very interested in goddess imagery. And so then I started doing these fireworks pieces with and painted bodies and matching the color of the bodies with the, and you know, then for years and years, I, years and years, nobody knew anything about this work. And so it only what started getting attention after the Pacific Standard Time Performance Festival allowed me to kind of pick up where I left off. How, since you teach, Andrea, and, um, how, how, I'm sitting here thinking like, how can we account for the fact that the audience and the art world, really, and the art market also is ready for this work now? And it wasn't ready for it then. I mean, the 60s were one thing, but what do you, what do you think of that? I mean, I look at these, you know, these performances, which look so amazing to me and so interesting, and yet, I mean, this is your business. I can't figure this out at all. <laughs> what the art world thinks is interesting and is not interesting. It's completely confusing. I mean, it's more about finally being historicized in some way, but there's still so many people that are not. So, and mainly women, you know, women's crisis is particularly a lot of the feminists or artists who work more yeah. 
ephemerally, their works are nowhere near the price as men. It's still totally unequal. But, I mean, it's exciting to that. I, I don't know. I mean, Can yeah. You hear her? Yeah. 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 I think, yeah. I think that I, one of the things that's interesting to hear Judy talk about is this pedagogy, this like, you know, program she developed in the way that it seemed survivalist in so many ways. What came out of it? was really life-changing for me. And I think that I've interpreted it in a different way, but it was, and then Suzanne picked it up and I worked a lot with Suzanne, but I had an epiphany, it was that when I was recently at Judy's birthday party, her 80th birthday party. And um, it was totally, it, um, there, they have, you have a museum that you've opened, and it's in support of that museum. It's a small, small alternative art space. Oh, that it's in support, though, of the community. <laughs> yes. And, you know, right. at Judy's birthday, the new young mayor was there, and the first lady. He's competing. They're coming here. They're yeah. coming here for this, and the old mayor is her hairdresser. Oh. And the local restaurant cooked all of the food for the party. And it was, but it was a very political event. It was organized. It wasn't just because the community was there. This is a project that Judy has worked really hard on. And that's also what I've learned from Suzanne. So part of like bringing these women together was, was about inventing real strategies of collaborative practices, of shared authorship, of community building, of thinking about you know, working with communities as a form of art, of uh, ephemeral practices, site specificity, so much of what I think about and who I am, and also having a political voice, like, but also being able to have it be personal and political at the same time. So there was a lot of important, like, and then out of, after the um, Feminist Art Program, then there was the women's building, too. Right? That was like, you could learn, I don't know if you, Nancy Buchanan's here, you were in the women's building, right? You could like, have your, some, you know, there would be caring for the kids, you know, you were taking care of. There was, you know, child care. You could learn how to call. That was Sheila. 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 But like, this all came out of all, of, you know, there was all this of video art, right? Like, I think about video art is the first generation of video art coming out of feminism. Yes. And, so, early performance. and this yeah. was all happening in this city. So much of it, right? It was happening in New York, too. But this was a locus for it. And these are all the things I've been drawn to and trying to learn about. But it seems like there's a historical amnesia, which I think history is still dominated by patriarchy. It's not, it's not amnesia, it's erasure. Erasure, oh, right? It's like erasure. throwing the archives of the feminist throwing art it away. away. And not showing these artists and right. not writing these histories. Right. And I mean, really, it's a miracle that, this is what I say, my career is a miracle. I mean, yeah. You know, I mean, like that will try to kill me and everything I ever did. But not only that, it was really important when there started to be curators like Connie. Like when all the curators are men and all the collectors are men. And it wasn't just, no, wait a second. I think it's really important, and this yeah. is going to segue right into what just happened to you. I think it's really important to acknowledge that in the 70s, we completely recast the discourse incorrectly because mm -hmm. we made it all about gender, mm -hmm. which means it is a lot about gender, but what it meant was we befriended a lot of women who were not our friends and we alienated a lot of men who could be, okay? Mm -hmm. Because it was not just But I also want to say that I, when I use the word patriarchy, I think a patriarchy a is a politics. It's a, it's a political system, right. and men or women can be in sense of patriarchy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in fact, women actually are the ones. Women practice general, general mutilation on their daughters. Women bound their daughters' feet. Women have been the enactors of patriarchal values. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's really important to us. It helps to explain what happened to me and what happened to you. 
when women turned on us. Okay? Like when the dinner party was going to be shown at UCLA, Arm and Hammer, the Women's Studies Department announced they were going to pick at the dinner party because it degraded women. And I'm like, by this time, the dinner party had traveled all around the world and been seen by a million people, all of whom recognized that the dinner party celebrated women and women's history. So how could all these feminist theorists in the 90s get it so completely wrong? Or how could a woman who was a victim of the patriarchal structure turn on you when you try to bring to the heart of the art world the reality of patriarchal violence against women. <laughs> you have to tell everybody what we have to do. No, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. It's important and it's instructive. And it's instructive that women yes. to change to understand how women can be our own worst enemies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. I mean, I think it's so complicated right now because um, I, I made a really controversial monumental artwork where I took uh, an act, you know, I took the Me Too movement and basically made book reports about it, but I made it like monumental. I mean, it's 170 photographs that are basic, or that are photographic prints that are mainly text that tell the story. They have the name of the, the accused, mainly, you know, like, for instance, Epstein is on my list, you know, Harvey Weinstein, you know. Um, there, I've only done 170, I have a list of over 400 names. I can't keep up with them fast enough. Um, and the piece is so monumental now. The walls are freestanding, 13 feet tall, and uh, I can't remember, 66 or 67 feet long, and they're painted red, and the prints are red. And I took photos from social media, mainly sort of like, I would just download photos of the men, um, kind of like creepy photos, but I also posted some <laughs> large actions that women did or online protests or like large text. And there was one woman who um, posted photos of herself with bruises. And um, as part of her, you know, as part of the movement. And I mean, I worked on this piece for two and a half years. I think I was like so personally invested in it. Um, so for me, it was so hard. So I was like, yeah, yeah. So like, she saw, it was like the hardest thing I've ever shown because it was in Basel and unlimited and that's separate from the fair and it's monumental works. And um, everybody in that room knew somebody on that wall, like taking power to the source and being like, look, we have to make change. And it's like this physical manifestation of patriarchy and of the Me Too movement. But she got really upset because I posted that photo. I reposted, I reprinted that photo. And I did not mean to re-traumatize her, but it turned into this one of those huge social media attacks. It was really painful. I apologize, but I think, you know, that there is this thing right now where, first of all, art is powerful. To take something and make it physical, like I took something that's social media, that's, that's like, ephemeral and I made it physical and it's a really powerful piece. It's probably the most powerful piece I'll ever make. But um and I want to say it took tremendous courage on Andrea's part to bring a piece like this into the heart of the Venice Biennale. <laughs> gave the art world a perfect excuse 
to avoid dealing with the content of the piece. It was like when it, it was like when feminist theorists attacked the dinner party, it gave the art world a perfect opportunity to say, see, the dinner party is like where? Yeah, it's funny, it's like these two works have a real similarity between different history. I mean, I apologize to her, I just want to say I apologize to her, but what I'm realizing is there's this really big difference between, like, like we're just dealing with social media too, and as women, um, or as, like, feminists, like, it's this thing, like, you tell this really personal story for the survivors, you're telling this personal story, but you're doing it on social media, right? And it's, like, so crazy, because... I understand the need to control that story, but at the same time, we've never dealt with such a such a structure like social media. And also, she posted it, and that sort of puts it into the public domain. I, I know, but I should have asked her. I think I should have asked her. Yeah, but you know what? Stop beating yourself up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Community that is based on the archive. In yeah, the it an art and so, yeah. and both of them also land into this territory of um, the problem of contemporary art in the bigger world, too. You know, whether it's Duchamp and like the found object in a way, which is what the dinner party was also, that image, the image of the woman's body. I mean, you were also, it also comes out of the Duchamp tradition. It does <laughs> not. <laughs> I'm sorry, Connie, it does not. I, I saw that piece of Duchamp's. In Philadelphia, at the museum, I was horrified by it. It was the embodiment of the male gaze, and the dinner party challenges the male gaze. And it's about it's about asserting female agency. Of course, yeah. And I think one could say it also engages with that history of Duchamp in the 20th century. I think, but we can we can we can do that later. We can do that. <laughs> I never did. Okay. And also, I don't like it, the fact that the, that the PC became so famous for is a quintessentially male object, right. the right. urinal. No, the urinal. Right. Like, how many of us have ever used one? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Desperation. Yeah. I don't know why. the kind of bad feminist women subject, which is a huge subject, obviously. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I think, you know, I'm I, I'm not, not a subject that's very often addressed. No, agreed. And I and I have a lot of strong things to say about it, too, But and I, it's part of my lived experience also now. But, yeah, I just... I don't think so. Why do you want to get away from the conversation? Um, because I think there are other things Okay, what do you want to talk but, about? <laughs> I also see a shift. Like, you know, I think a lot about that. Like, I think there's a shift generationally in what feminist artists are thinking is okay and what you can do. You know, like I talked to you about that, that Adrian Kiger piece, which I just uh, the, the where you go into the box and you see, you know, that beating of... Um, What's Rodney, King. Rodney King. It's like such a powerful work. It's such a political work. But then there's so much trauma, you know, for the family or for, for maybe even the black culture to have to see that over and over again. So our values are shifting, I think. And I feel like I'm learning and thinking about that and trying to figure all of this stuff and who has out. the authority to tell and Yeah, who has the authority to tell Yeah, and that's tricky too because, right. like, you know, I am a survivor, right? Of, of sexual harassment or sexual violence. So sometimes I think I was so, and Suzanne totally disagrees with me on this, but I was so deeply involved in, in projecting my myself onto these women's stories that maybe I didn't have enough subjectivity sometimes to like, because I was so deep into it because it was my story. Too. Actually, no, that's very interesting because one of the things I actually had to deal with 
in Fresno and then ongoing with working with young women had to do with the, how hot a lot of their subject matter was yeah. and helping them establish aesthetic distance so they could actually work with their subject matter. I mean, God knows I've worked with lots of hot subject matter. And so, like, my new show that's about to open is like, grief inducing subject matter like what we're doing i mean like the, I'm, I'm about to open a show in washington called the end a meditation on death and extinction that i worked on for six years mm -hmm. and you know that part about it that has to do with personal mortality was easy compared to the part that deals with what we're doing to other creatures on this planet and the scale of it i mean to so this thing about how do you engage people so that they will look at subject matter that is so hot and so emotion inducing like for example there's one image that's about the finning of sharks okay so like for sharks fit fin soup in china uh they fin sharks alive and then the sharks sink to the bottom of the ocean floor because they can't swim, they can't eat, they can't hunt, and they suffocate to death. This is done to 100 million sharks a year. Okay. So how do you help people look at subject matter that is so loaded? This is actually where I believe, I actually believe this is the function of beauty in art. That beauty, and I used all my skills to make images that were so incredibly visually gorgeous that it would allow people time to think about the subject matter. Because, I mean, so I had to do a lot of that over the years with my students. Or it just slows down the judgment. You know, the aesthetics and the factor, the way it's made, it kind of slows down the judgment, so maybe they can change the it, it, it's it's a lot of a path. Yeah, right. Right. see, I think, I think this is something, and you know, when, when people say our art is political, it always makes me furious. Because if you think about all this, and, okay, so there's a big article about Richard Serra, uh, 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 last Sunday's New York Times, right? It's all about the tonnage, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, it is like, it is like the embodiment of the construct of masculinity. Tough, forbidding, imposing, powerful, strong. What's that? That's what a man's supposed to be, right? So what are you telling me? That our work is political and his isn't? His is the carrier of patriarchal values. We only have two minutes more. <laughs> <laughs> Our timer just gave me this signal. Um, sure. Yeah. Who do we want to call us? Um, there's some amazing artists in the audience. There are. Yeah. 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 Mary, Mary.
to Food and Flower Art Space. There's a woman who's the director of Food and Flower Art Space that arose out of our communities. Dal and I live in a small town in New Mexico. New Mexico suffered greatly from the recession, especially the small rural towns like where we live. And our town wants to develop an arts corridor on the street where we live and where the Three the Flowers building is. And our, they came to us and asked us if we would anchor the art space, the art corridor, and our mayor. There was like this whole right wing assault that actually made it to the New York Times. Ah, my God, the lid in the New York Times. Anyhow, um, so our mayor gave his entire sal year salary to start the fundraising, and our whole community came together and raised the money to renovate the space. And the mother-in-law of the mayor is the director of the space, and she has been, she does the tours in the space. And we have been watching what art can do because in fact, I'm having my first retrospective in the spring at the De Young in May. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> and I'm to the training. I'm actually going to bring Lena Malcolm because she's been doing these tours and people are spending between two and five hours in the space, which is a demonstration that if art has, if art has meaning, to the viewers, and it's about subjects they care about, and they're helped to engage with that. You do not need fancy technology <laughs> and digital, uh, like, manipulations or yoga classes to get people to come to the museum. <laughs> so thank you from the Food and Flower Arts Space. <laughs> that I've heard um, that women are supporting women in such a beautiful way and it's it's really moving to me I'm sitting here with tears in my heart and what moves me to ask you a question is what are we doing about the art that's being lost in our children the schools in America are not really supporting children to become artists to nurture them to have schools of life where they can be nourished. And parents are kind of falling in line with schools because the public system isn't really doing it. So as a mother and as a grandmother, I would love to know what, what can we do or what's your suggestion? How can we just plant a seed? I'm an artist, but many of us aren't. Many of us who are mothers and sisters and aunts and grandmothers are not as gifted and as lucky to have all that creativity at our fingertips. So how can we give birth to it in the next generation and the generation after that? I think it's just, the answer is just start from like, you know, a museum perspective. Well, yeah, I mean, I can talk about one very small program that we have that I, that I think should be a pilot program for, you know, many museums. Um, of a certain scale, I suppose, which is that we, in answer to the, in some small answer to this problem, have a program where we bring school kids um, and we work with, um, I think it's two schools a year, to bring the kids for a week-long intensive, their entire program happens at the museum for an entire week, which is really a lot if you think about it. You know, they suspend their classes, they come, they bring their lunch, they, we get the transportation money, all these things, and it's for kids. Um, in public schools where, the, where there is no longer any art program. And the letters that we get, the drawings that they make, um, 
the video responses to what they're seeing are incredible. What they can do with that week-long immersion is amazing. I mean, it's exactly what you're speaking to, and it's worth a whole year of art education in some ways, although, of course, we wish it was longer, you know, and it's hard for the kids to take the time out of the curriculum, but if we, if we could grow it, we could do more schools and so on. And it's, um, it's become, it, my colleague Teresa said, um, model in the art education community, but it's, you know, it's one small, one small thing. And it's hard because I think museums in many ways are asked now to fill a lot of these gaps. And we can do a lot and it's really interesting now to think also with artists about how to, through the museum, do public engagement work, do socially engaged work, but you know, it's a small fraction of what the need is. We have to vote. For, we need to vote for leaders. We need to vote for leaders who believe in education as a human right and believe that critical creative thinking matters from the very local level all the way up to the very national level and that's the only way it's going to change. We have to make it change. brother's girlfriend was a feminist art critic at the time. I didn't know what that meant. And there was, I, 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 I couldn't imagine how you, as a woman, could conceive of this work and even think about putting all those historical women together at the dinner party. And to show you how I grew up was like, I didn't know you were allowed to do that. And that, your work and reading about it helped me conceptualize art. I'm a numbers person. I don't know from art, but I go to the museums all the time and I love it and it speaks to me. But but there's something about what you did that as a young woman growing up allowed me to start imagining what art could do and what women artists could do. And I wonder what you have to say to sort of the young you today, that 19 year old, 20 year old, who's thinking about art school and wondering how it all can happen and how it all come together, what your two, the two artists are thinking about how you would speak to that person. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a real challenge for young artists now. Uh, when I came up in the LA art scene, nobody ever thought they were gonna make any money. And uh, it was not about money, it was not about the market. And it, it's like people, at, when I get interviewed, people are always asking me if I'm pissed off that it took so long for the art world to turn around. I'm like, no. I had like 50 years of uninterrupted art making. <laughs> <laughs> that is something that young It's inconceivable. And they get picked up, swallowed up, and spit out at an accelerating rate. And what I would tell any young artist is find your own voice. And until that happens, stay the fuck away from the art market. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a big task to find one's own voice. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm more concerned. I always. You know, I, ha I had amazing teachers like Charles Gaines and Michael Asher and, you know, uh, Millie Wilson. They would always talk about the importance of t teaching. Like, no matter what happens, you always have to teach. And lately, teaching is becoming unethical for me. Because how do I allow my students to have fifty to a hundred thousand dollars of debt when they leave. Yeah, well, or two so or two yeah, but once the once the loans start accruing, you know, it can go up to three, three hundred I mean it's crazy, three hundred thousand dollars. So I don't know what to do other than to start thinking about alternative forms of education that we need to develop or we need to until the government decides to forgive student debt and make afford you know affordable 
no interest loans. Why are we giving low interest? Why isn't education free? I don't know. So I am a capitalist society. I know. But like I don't know. I think education should be free. Well, I know, but well, but we have community colleges. Like, what if this kind of education is in community colleges? What if it should be affordable? It's not affordable. You can't strap. I have one assistant whose debt is three hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Oh my god. Okay, this, how do you do this? So something's got to change. How do we do this? I mean, let me, but it's like some of these questions have to do with like, how do you solve problems that are way bigger than the individual? So even right. that question about teaching, like, and about our art in the schools. And okay, so Donald and I live in New Mexico. Actually, we were talking last night to Tony Ressler, who's involved with LACMA and trying to do like programs for children and all that stuff. That's so much fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, in New Mexico, uh, for years, Donald and I could not understand how we could have gotten perfectly good public school education. And New Mexico public schools are not even graduating half the kids. I mean, kids can't read, they can't do math, they're just like, that, you know, so we had a state senator from our town who happened to be the head of the New Mexico, the state legislature, senator, and his wife was a teacher, and so we used to go to their like Christmas padrone parties because that's the political structure in New Mexico. And one time, Donald and I asked Lynn, like, what is it with these schools? I mean, we're just not getting this. Okay, so she described something to us that we had never thought about, which is the kids come to school, nobody has ever read to them, mm -hmm. nobody spends time with them, they don't even know English, a lot of them, they haven't had anything to eat, they a lot of them have been abused, one parent is maybe in jail, the other parent doesn't even have a high school level diploma, and these kids come to the schools, and the teachers are expected to solve social problems that are at such a huge level in terms of the breakdown of our social structure and our social net and our responsibility to the citizens of this country. And art is one piece of that. The lack of art education is one piece of this huge societal problem. It's like when I was at Miami Basel, there was a whole like panel about, you know, I was not, but I was before a panel on it, about the inequity of prices for women. And so carried over into the conversation I had and this woman asked a question about the inequity of prices of, for women artists, and it was the same thing. We live in a culture, we live in a world that doesn't value what women do. One person cannot, yeah, you can try and make a difference, you can try and make change, which I've devoted my life to, mm -hmm. but it's important to understand. It's like, you know, eating, uh, kale is not going to solve the world's <laughs> problem with energy and too many, you know, people and too much cattle. I mean, it's like, so how do you find a path I do where you too. feel I like you kale. can actually make a contribution? <laughs> like, but you can really make a contribution. I mean, on any of these levels, it's and what can art do? And what is art's role in this? And what can we do as artists? I think those are really big questions, and they're questions that are by and large avoided in the art world. It's like, how do I get a gallery? You know, put your slides together. And yet, I mean, I totally agree with everything you're saying, Judy, but, and yet it has actually changed a great deal, though, right? Especially for women, maybe not especially, but for women artists. I mean, certainly the women of course, that you teach it would be are entering a completely different world. Yes, it would be insane for me to say. Right. It's, it's, like, it's like I keep saying this, you know, I love going on Instagram 
and seen all these sites club clitoris, vagina, china, <laughs> women, you know, like <laughs> celebrating their bodies, big red flit. I mean, like, really? It wasn't even conceivable when I was young. So it would be the same to say things that Jay. And in some ways, <laughs> And so that's where we started, right? That's great. Jay, you did it. Yes, things have changed. There's still farther to go, though. Exactly. That's what I would like to say. And There's a lot of way to go. In fact, it's much more granular now, and it's much more sort of subterranean <laughs> the work that we all have to do, I think. Not me. I'm just going to keep fighting right out in the open. Well. <laughs>